So here's what we're going to do now. We're going to evaluate the same inner product twice. First, we'll do it directly using the definition without any mention of bases or component spaces. Then we will perform the equivalent operation in the component space. So this line right here is the strict divide between the quote unquote real space and the component space. And the point of this exercise is for these concepts to crystallize in your minds. And you should also keep in mind that while in linear algebra classes that emphasize treating objects on their own terms, you mostly do this, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in real life you do this almost exclusively because you're dealing with linear spaces far more complicated than this and inner products far more complicated than this and dimensions far greater than three. And so you end up with matrices that are a thousand by a thousand and in any case there's lots of reasons to in some circumstances when they call for it to prefer component spaces. Okay, so here's the exercise. Given this inner product, and for this exercise we don't have to have an inner product. We don't need positive definiteness. We only need distributivity and symmetry, and you can even give that up as well. But in any case, so given this inner product, we did choose an inner product, evaluate the inner product of these two vectors. And it'll be a number, which we're about to calculate. And then what we're going to do, we will choose this basis and we'll represent the inner product by the inner product matrix that captures this inner product in the component space. We will then translate each one of these vectors into their components. And by calculating the appropriate matrix product, we should come up with the same number. Just to show you that A, this works, and to highlight the difference between the two worlds. Okay, is, is the goal clear? Let's go the direct route first. The direct route means doing polynomial things with polynomials. And this is a polynomial sort of thing. Integrate. So the inner product of P and Q, and it equals, I think I could do it in my head, one half plus one quarter. One half plus a quarter, I'm sorry, this should be three quarters. Do you agree that the answer here is three quarters? No, one half minus one quarter. So one quarter. I want agreement from everybody because I don't want to have a mismatch at the most climactic moment and be disappointed. One quarter, we agree? Okay, so this is doing it directly. Was there any mention of bases? No. Were there any components? No. This was the ultimate in treating objects on their own terms. We did the sort of thing you can do with polynomials, multiply them together and integrate them. Now we're going to go into the component space. And we will first evaluate that matrix that absorbs into it all of the information about the inner product. So much so that once you calculate this matrix, you never have to calculate another integral. Yes, we'll have to calculate six integrals for all possible distinct pairs of, of basis elements to construct this matrix, but once you do that, you never have to do another integral directly. You never have to do another inner product directly. Just like with linear transformations, in order to figure out the matrix that represents the linear transformation, you have to affect the linear transformation as many times as there are elements in the basis. But once you do that, you never have to evaluate another linear transformation. You can just multiply by that matrix. Okay, so you remember what this matrix is? It's the matrix of pairwise inner products of the basis elements. So this right here will be one dotted with itself. You tell me what it is. Half. I'll just, I'll do a couple here. And it equals one half. Everybody's in agreement? Okay, we'll do one more explicitly. And then the rest we'll try to do in our head and just write down the answer. Okay, what goes here? This dotted with this. Let's see what that is.
Now let's do this one dotted with x squared. That's a quarter. Let's do x squared dotted with itself. That's sixth. x squared dotted with this. And finally this, oh my goodness, it will be Seventeen, twelve. Is this matrix positive definite? Yes, it is. We discovered that last time. It has to be positive definite. So now we're in position to carry out the same inner product in component space. I should say in the component space, right? In the component space. Okay, but for that I need to represent each one of these in terms of its components, because we have a recipe for manipulating the components. So we have to figure out what those components are. So we will write, we need 1 plus x and 1 minus x. So what are the components of 1 plus x? Super easy. 0, 1, 0, it's one of the basis elements. And what are the components of 1 minus x? 2 minus 1, 0. And now all that's left to do is to evaluate the triple product I didn't want to duplicate the matrix M so we'll have to, we have some work to do in our heads. So I think this product is easier because it'll just pick out the column. And that, so that will be the middle column and now when we're multiplying it by this matrix, we have to take two of the first entry and subtract the second and let it please be one quarter. So two of the first element minus the second. 10, 6, minus 17, 12. Hold on. One quarter. So does this help clarify this dual, not dual, parallel worlds of real spaces and component spaces. Everything here is in terms of vectors themselves. Everything here is in terms of their components. Everything here you have to do things natural to the vectors themselves. For polynomials it's graph, evaluate, multiply, integrate, differentiate. In the, compo in the component space it's only matrix multiplication. For geometric vectors it's draw and measure. For polynomials it's what I just mentioned. For vectors in Rn, it's do something with entries, manipulate them in some way. For audio signals, it's filter, amplify, transmit. When, it, when you get into the component space, it's always the same thing. This kind of matrix product. That's, those are the dual world, the parallel worlds of real and component spaces. Oh, because that's what it was here, right? That's the, re that's the, so, <laughs> so I want to throw a good word, invariant. So it's a good, it's actually a good question. So it has to be one quarter because that's the inner product of these two vectors. This is just another way of calculating the same answer. And so this gives me an opportunity to throw out a wonderful word from tensor calculus. And by the way, all of this is very much related to tensor calculus in the following way. And that word is invariant. Why am I calling this one quarter an invariant? And what's a, compared to an invariant, what's a variant? Well, when people say invariant versus a variant, they mean what would change and what would remain unchanged if we chose a different basis. It's a question of ba a choice of basis. So if I chose another basis, would this matrix be the same? No, it would be a completely different matrix because the vectors that I'm dotting to form this matrix are totally different. Would these components be the same? No, they would be very different because we're decomposing those vectors with respect to, the, to a different basis. But once I combine them into this combination, will I still get one quarter? Yes, because it's the same inner product, just in a different component space. So this result is an invariant. And the 
in a product matrix, as well as the components of vectors, are variants. And so tensor calculus, I'm indulging myself, studies what kind of variants there are. And there are two kinds of variants. There are covariants and there are contravariants. And you will learn that this is a contravariant tensor. This is likewise a contravariant tensor. And this is a doubly covariant tensor. So when you put it all together, all of the variant and covariant parts match together to produce an invariant. That's the beauty of that subject, and it's also the beauty of linear algebra. 